Restoring Darkness is brought to you by Devluma, illuminating the pursuit of dark skies. Welcome back to the Restoring Darkness podcast. Today, I'm honored to be joined by Dr. Catherine Darley. Dr. Darley is, a, is the leader in natural sleep medicine. She combines her knowledge of the sleep and circadian disorders with her training as a naturopathic physician to bridge these two fields. She's treated patients for over 20 years. Along with training healthcare providers in sleep medicine, Dr. Darley now focuses on teaching people sleep skills so they can thrive at home, at work, and have a high quality life. You can find her online at skilledsleeper.com, spelled the way it sounds, skilledsleeper.com. And she's on Instagram and Sub- Substack, and the links to the Instagram and the Substack will be posted on the Restoring Darkness podcast page. So if you go to that page, you can, you'll find links to, to Dr. Darley's work there. And also her website, Become a Skilled Sleeper, will be posted there as well. But before we go into that, i got to tell you folks about the Lighting and Darkness Foundation. That's right, 501c3, not-for-profit. That means we can give charitable tax receipts to you folks out there that supports this work. And there's a couple things going on right now. Number one, we're looking, I am the interim executive director, but I happen to be a pretty busy guy. And the executive director of the Lighting and Darkness Foundation is a full-time job. And so if you're interested in becoming the executive director of the Lighting and Darkness Foundation, go to restoringdarkness.com and contact us. Um, Also, you know, I've worked on political campaigns. I've worked on all kinds of campaigns. And some of the things that I've learned over that time is there's people give in different ways. Some people give with their time. Some people give by, by writing. Some people give by writing letters and emails and contacting people. Um, others knock on doors. Some people run as politicians or do different things. Other people give money. And you know what? Giving money is not less or more than any of those other things. It's just one of those things that we need to move these types of things forward. And this is a very powerful movement. So if you're interested in supporting us and you can't volunteer and you don't know what to do, go to restoringdarkness.com, click the donate link. Why not become a monthly donor? That would be the best thing for us. I'll tell you right now, we should, we could really use it knowing how much money's coming in. Um, also, if you want to help a particular campaign on the restoringdarkness.com website, you can click darkness campaigns and you can help the good folks in the Wasatch Back Valley of Salt, of Utah where they're in a ordinance battle right now to prevent an ordin- uh, well to reverse an ordinance change that allows uplight in a pristine beautiful dark sky environment and I know it is because I've been there and I spoke to them and I was there and you wouldn't believe from mountain range to mountain range the starry skies very very beautiful so go to restoringdarkness.com if you want to help us out Dr. Catherine Darley welcome to the Restoring Darkness podcast Thank you very happy to be here Um you know, it's, it's, I've, I've done hundreds and hundreds of lighting podcasts and darkness podcasts. We've got to put both of those in there and all kinds of other podcasts. But, and I've spoken to many of the um, foremost circadian researchers in the world. And while they don't all 100% agree with me, my conclusion is that all of the benefits of anything related to circadian rhythm are secondary to the sleep. If you can improve people's sleep then their alertness comes up, then they live healthier, they don't get sick as much, all these other things. Is that kind of, I don't know, gut instinct of mine after talking to so many people about this correct? I would actually give a little bit different view, if that's all right. Sure. So I think about the earth as the foundation for our physiology, that human physiology developed in response and embedded in this, excuse me, earth that has its own circadian rhythm, right? The sun goes down predictable times and the sun comes up predictable times. There's temperature changes that accompany the sunset and that our circadian rhythm is like the second layer that is connecting the earth and our physiology. And then sleep is above that. So the earth, circadian rhythm, sleep. And, um, you know, we think about sleep states, REM sleep, non-REM sleep, and wakefulness as the three states of alertness in sleep, the sleep world. We don't just divide it into sleep and wake. And all of those states are really dependent on our circadian rhythm. 
So when you say you're looking at physio, oh, my mic was off. So when you say that you're 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 layering it, you have the earth with the circadian cycle on top of it, and then on top of that is sleep. Um, you know, we're not nocturnal animals, and so you know, and we develop differently. Is this physiology, this base physiology created by the earth? Is that the is that or those rhythms or those cycles the foundation of life? Like, is that is that what it is? That there there's this planet out there that's rotating around a you know nuclear fission reactor, and you that those cycles are what life is. Is that I mean, do you understand what I'm asking you in a sense? I think so. Let me respond, and we can sure. fine tune as we go. Um, yeah, I think you know with the electric light we have removed ourselves from that circadian rhythm of mm -hmm. the earth, right? Mm -hmm. We can have it be bright in the middle of the night. We can have a banana in February in the Pacific Northwest, which is where I'm at, which is a calorie and nutrient profile we would just never see historically. And so mm -hmm. there's many ways that we have removed ourselves from the circadian rhythm of the earth. And because our circadian rhythm, our inherent circadian rhythm is designed for those rhythmic predictable changes, we, our circadian rhythm is not functioning as well. And that not only impacts our sleep, but it impacts other organ systems too. Um, you know, each, I'd love to talk when it's time a, a little bit about some of the circadian physiology that I'm talking about here, referring sure. to. Sure. So before we go there, um, the and so you're making this claim almost at the species level. Like as a species, we've disrupted this with electric light because there isn't any, really many humans left out there that don't live in a, in a light polluted environment. The vast amount of us, majority of us, live in heavily but light polluted environments. So this is a species level problem. This this disruption. I think so for sure. You know, I'm sure that you and your listeners are aware that it's. Uh, over 80% of human beings are currently living with light pollution at night, but we need darkness for proper physiology. And without that darkness, it's going to have a cascading effect on our health. And what are some of the effects it has? And then we'll get into the circadian thing you mentioned. Well, light at night, I'm sure some of your other um, speakers have talked about really uh, suppresses our natural melatonin and people most people have heard about melatonin and its importance for sleep but melatonin is actually a molecule that goes throughout the body and has a very strong antioxidant effect it has an um, anti-inflammatory effect it is neuroprotective it has many other roles in the body. And so if we're not, if we're suppressing our overall melatonin secretion and changing the pattern of melatonin secretion by having too much light at night, or I think of it as a darkness deficiency, that's gonna have this, um, you know, cascading effect throughout our system really. And then how do you layer these circadian systems into that? Tell me more about that then. Well, <clears throat> we have a central pacemaker in our brain, which is um, responsive to the light dark cues, but we also have multiple layers of our circadian system from the cellular level to the tissue level. And we basically want all of those systems, the, all the levels of the system to be entrained and synchronized so it's working together and when we're not getting predictable cues then we're not as synchronized and that can also contribute to ill health um, you know for an ex example um, you know with the electric light for those of us who are on a daytime schedule yes we have a routine of waking up in the morning, turning on the lights in the evening, turning down the lights to go to sleep. But our habits with the light switch are nowhere near as predictable as the time that the sun goes down and the mm. time the sun get, goes up, right? Mm. You know, depending on where you are in the earth, of course, 
it, it's going to change. This time of sunset is going to change over season to season, but it's going to be in very small increments day by day. Whereas with our electric light at home, we could turn it off at nine one night to go to bed early and then the next night have light until midnight stay up for a social occasion. So mm. that, you know, that is not enough regularity for our systems to operate well. And so this regularity um, is being disrupted uh, by anthropogenic light pollution. Is that the major factor or is it, is it, or are you considering computers and TVs and laptops and screens? Are they light pollution or is that something different? I would consider that to be a form of light pollution. I mean, your work is more on, um, regional and outdoor mm. light pollution, but, mm. uh, you know, that is going to affect people also because basically if there's enough light that you can hold your hand out at arm's length and see your fingers wiggling, that is enough light to suppress your melatonin mm. somewhat. Uh, so the system is really quite, quite sensitive. And I think at this point, most people have heard about avoiding blue light, turning off your devices or wearing blue blocking glasses or whatnot. Um, many people have heard that, but I think the part of the conversation that's been missing is that identification of how very sensitive the system is, um, hmm. you know, because you want your bedroom to be that dark that you cannot see your fingers wiggling, which many bedrooms are not that dark, both because of sky glow and those types of issues, uncontrolled lighting, but also people's practices in their homes. Do they have a night light? Do they have little, you know, LED lights on devices in their bedroom space? Mm. That also makes a difference. The how do you explain moonlight and starlight then? Because I know that when I if on a brightly lit moonlight night, you you can see quite well actually. Yes, and often people say that their sleep is disturbed when the moon is full, and I wonder oh, if that's if that is part of it. Um, you know, people ascribe different, uh, attributions to the full moon. So, um, oh. you know, <laughs> right. <laughs> um, but certainly the light can affect people's sleep and there is a little bit of research looking at is people's sleep actually disrupted when the moon is full. And it does seem that there is something to that. Uh, it's not a question that's been studied widely, but there are a few studies showing that. Well, we, you know, and, and, I, and just to, to, I don't, I'm sure this is maybe outside your range, but I mean, humans didn't evolve sleeping in fields under the moonlight either, I suppose. I, I think they would have been in trees or in, in shelters of some kind or caves, and they would have spent their evenings in caves around fires. Is there a difference between, so what would happen, and this is only my imagination, is you'd be our ancestors would be sleeping around a fire and that above their heads would be something to stop rain from falling on them. This is creating the darkness. And as they fell asleep, the fire would go down and down and down and it would be dark. Um, is there some relationship that you're aware of between firelight, that warm Kelvin temperature, the idea of light also containing heat waves at the same time that does something to help us feel relaxed and um, feel I mean, when you think about TV, we're still sitting around a hearth in a way at night. You know what I'm saying? Like it, like it's it's the same. I we sit down at night and we stare at this light. And our, you know, when you're at a cottage up north in Canada, you sit around the fire and you stare at this fire, and you and you're not distracted by the TV. But there's something about that. Is there something in the heat or the the warm colors of of, of fire that does not makes us sleepy and makes us feel secure and safe that we're we've lost? Yeah, so uh, as you know, the natural sunlight ha goes from ultraviolet into the visual spectrum and then into the infrared spectrum, and there's ra radio waves on the outside of that. And our, we have some specialized cells in our eyes between the rods and cones that yeah. are specifically measuring what color of light it is. So at the shorter end, end of the visible 
wavelength is the blue colors. And then we go into yellows, uh, greens and yellows, and then orange and red. And those orange red are much longer wavelengths. Mm -hmm. So these specialized cells in the eye are measuring blue light and they send a signal to this area of the brain called the suprachiasmatic nucleus, which is called the central pacemaker in our circadian rhythm. And in the presence of blue light, the suprachiasmatic nucleus sends a signal to the pineal gland, don't make melatonin. And the morning light is much higher in those blue spectrums, sunrise, well, after the first hour, the first half of the day is much higher in blue light. And that is very alerting for us. As the light shifts, sunset happens, people back in the day would light their fires or their candles or whatnot that give more of that yellowish, golden, reddish hues. Then since our eye is not receiving that blue light signal, the suprachiasmatic nucleus lifts that signal and the pineal gland starts to create melatonin. And the immediate action of melatonin in the brain is it does make us drowsy. So if people are, you know, they don't have their blue light devices, computers, other screens, TVs, but they have firelight, then their melatonin may start to rise and cause them to feel relaxed Hmm. and start being ready to sleep. So that's how that mechanism works. And, um, you know, Hmm. I think that in, in an ideal world, people set their phone to have an alarm with the sunset in their location. And at that time they start shutting down the lights and really mimicking whatever the light is outdoors. Of course, in Northern or, uh, you know, at the poles, it's going to be a lot harder and, and mm-hmm. probably not appropriate, but around the equator and um, some degrees north and south of that, it would be really great to kind of embrace living with the sun. That would be ideal for circadian rhythms, certainly. You know, it's interesting that whenever we study the zoological or at least we have zoological studies of animals. We look at them and we make all these comments about how these non-conscious beings behave and do things. Yet we seem to ignore that we're 99% non-conscious processes too. Like nobody decides to digest their food, right? It doesn't, <laughs> right. like, okay, I'm going to, it's time to push the digestion button on my brain here. And yeah, there we go. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, there, there it goes. Right. Um, nobody decides that. Um, you know, we don't decide to feel tired. We don't decide to sweat. We don't decide to blink our eyes. You know, uh, all the different non-conscious processes are being disrupted like crazy in the modern world, actually. And it just occurred, while you were talking right. about that, all these things are happening and people are talking, well, I'm going to go work out and I'm going to get healthy. I'm going to go, you know, do all these sorts of things. But we have really, before we do anything else, I think we should fix all the things that we're doing that disrupt our digestion, our sleep. Um, all these other things that we're not, we don't get to decide when it happens actually. Right. My part of my, part of my, um, personal mission in life is to work on creating environments that people can thrive in. Mm. And I do that, you know, in my career and outside of my career with volunteer activities and whatnot. But, um, you know, I think that we are so embedded in our environment, however much we don't acknowledge that. And we need to have an environment that is health promoting and that, you know, doing all of the things you mentioned, going to the gym, et cetera, et cetera, eating uh, healthy foods, all of those self-care things are not going to be enough in my view to really optimize your health. If you're in a uh, poor light, dark environment. And, uh, that's why I've been working with this phrase darkness deficiency, because Mm -hmm. when we hear that word deficiency, I think somehow it, uh, gets people attention more than if you say artificial light at night, artificial light at night, everybody's like, 
yeah, we've got artificial light at night. What's the big deal? But if you yeah. say darkness deficiency because of the deficiency that we hear, hear about with nutrients or other health parameters, that makes us go, oh, wait a minute, I need darkness. Mm -hmm. And then we can start having this conversation about melatonin and all the health effects downstream. And I think it's, you know, that's why I'm wanting to talk with people about this idea. So uh, I, I think words and descriptions are so important because, you know, one of the things when I, I first entered this, um, this space of, I'm in the lighting industry, okay? I work in the lighting industry every day. And, um, you know, I entered the space and we were talking about naming this show. And, you know, we had a couple names. One was Starving for Darkness. It was called that for a while, Starving for Darkness. I love that phrase. It's now called Restoring mm -hmm. Darkness because the board of directors wanted us to get away, be something more positive or a call to action. And, um, but, you know, one of the names was going to be Dark Skies Ahead. And I just thought, man, that sounds so negative. And the way that this movement uses that term dark sky is so confusing. It cannot be translated into other languages. Um, you know, and so we've, we've sort of, as a board and a group, we've coined the phrase darkness restoration and night preservation as the goals of the movement. And what that is, is we want to preserve night in, in our, un, our environments that don't have light pollution. And that's easy. That's really easy to do. And then we want to restore, uh -huh. we want to restore darkness incrementally to our heavily light polluted environments in a manner that, you know, citizens, um, accept and is incremental and that will take a long time um and so those are the two things that we want to do you explain that to someone that makes instant sense to them what we want is dark skies no not really dark skies we want beautiful stars skies filled with stars but they're, they're, you know it's a kind of an astronomical right. it's an astronomical term it comes from an astronomical society dark sky international great people by the way they do great work it's just the the phrase i i, I don't like and so I think it's the darkness deficiency is another powerful way to talk about human health specifically. And I'm going to steal it from you and I'm going to use it like crazy. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, yeah. So I think, you know, one of the, um, one of the concerns that I have is that we know that light and dark shift melatonin. Mm -hmm. We also know that, other hormones may be affected and that other hormones have a circadian rhythm to them. For instance, thyroid hormone, right? Mm -hmm. Many people have been diagnosed with hypothyroid and so they're familiar with the thyroid hormone. Thyroid hormone has a circadian rhythm where it is more, it's elevated in the morning. And there are other, many other circadian rhythms in hormones specifically. And one of the concerns I have, since we know that melatonin is suppressed by abnormal light, dark conditions is what about the other hormones and the data that we have in terms of what's normal hormone levels has really only been collected in this time that human beings have mm, been exposed to abnormal health conditions. So, uh, or abnormal light conditions, excuse me. Mm. So are those lab norms for, um, for all these hormones actually really optimal or are we measuring something that has already been changed and may therefore may not be optimal? Hmm. You know, there's, that's one of those problems that you run into where you, the more you learn, the more, you know, you need to learn, <laughs> you know, Yes. Right. it's like, you know, hey, I'm looking at, and that's why, you know, that's why I think we need to be very careful about defaulting everything to models and data. You know, everyone say, everybody says they want to be just data driven, but I think we also need to listen to our practitioners like you, people that work with humans every day on their individual health and try to coach them. And so, yes, data is important, but you know, data can be what, as you're saying, you're foundationally wrong. You know, like it's foundation right. could be, could be wrong from, from the start. Wow. That's a really big problem, isn't it? 
Yeah. And um, to be honest, I'm the only person I know of who has mentioned that as potentially a problem. And so I don't know what the, you know, there's no uh, data that I'm aware of that looks at, okay, this is what the hormones look like when somebody has been living in an artificial light environment, like mm -hmm. most people do. And this is what their hormone profile looks like when they spend a year only getting naturalistic light, dark conditions. That would be a very, very interesting study for me. And I'm not aware of any uh, group that's working on that kind of research. Do you, do you, do you do research? Like you, are you, can you conduct a study? Is that in your um, skill set to be able to conduct a, a study like that? I think, um, sorry, there's a dog okay. barking. Hey, um, so um, I don't do that kind of really mm. primary research. I more look at um, all the research that's out there and think about it and integrate it in line with my expertise. Now, um, the, I want to ask you a delicate question. You know, we often hear right. about um, race in the news and, you know, we're a species and, you know, people talk about it historically. It's always spoken about what happened in the past. But, you know, I was speaking to a, um, a researcher um, or a teacher in Sweden um, and he was saying that it's pretty clear to them that people that, you know, whose ancestors come from southern climates struggle in, in, in northern climates. So if they move from, say, a sub-Saharan Africa to Sweden, that they seem to suffer significantly more from things like seasonal defective disorder, depression, these types of things. Is there differences within humans in a, in a practice like yours where you look at someone that perhaps has moved from India to northern Quebec in Canada? Is there something that you need to be more sensitive to them and say, look, you know what, to, let's just talk about this right now you're probably going to need to be even more vigorous on your sleep schedule and this sort of stuff than the average person here, because you're likely to be affected more by this. Is that, is that even in the research? Is there anything that you've seen that, that connects those things? Um, I believe that is not my specialty. I do believe that I have seen a little bit of research that does suggest that, um, that people from different parts of the world as they, um, immigrate and, and populations migrate that they do have more difficulties with seasonal affective disorder and sleep, but I can't comment any more than that. One of, you know, earlier you said about how people can't decide to uh, start their di digestive process or whatnot. Sure. And one area that I am, one population that I am very concerned about is the population of teenagers um, because they get a bad rap in terms of sleep and circadian rhythms. One of the things that happens, Michael, at the very beginning of puberty, before you're seeing hair growth or physical changes, is a young person's circadian rhythm starts to swing later. And that will happen from age 10 on up to 2021 20, for women, 21, 22 for men. And, you know, I think teenagers get a bad rap of, oh, if they would just, you know, get off their phone at night, they would sleep much better. They'd be mm. able to go to sleep earlier and wake up earlier. And that is just absolutely not true. And so that's my, um, that's my soapbox that I want to stand on is that, you know, when you're thinking about how intrinsic our circadian rhythm is, it starts at the brain with the uh, central pacemaker, and then there's clock genes in every cell that makes it do more mm. or less of its function at different times of day. So, you know, for those people, teenagers, others, adults too, who are on these later schedules, just think about it as something and as um, immutable and something that was not their choice, like height. You know, if somebody's super mm. tall, you're not going to say, oh, well, if you just did X, Y, Z, you could be a little shorter. Like, no, that's not going to work. Right. Mm. And the same thing with if someone is strongly, strongly a night owl or an extreme uh, night owl, there's a disorder called delayed sleep wake phase. And those are folks who are falling asleep uh, between one and six in the morning, typically. 
So if somebody, if you know somebody like that in that situation, it's not their lifestyle choices. It's just their set point. Well, the other thing too, is I think we should all focus on ourselves when it comes to this kind of thing, unless you're like Dr. Darley in a, in a, in a, I, I don't give people advice. I just talk about the issues on a podcast. Um, you know, but I, you know, the, the, the whole idea, I think we, this, when you mentioned about the data, the base data could be incorrect. And I, I think many of our sum, assumptions about what, what human beings are could be incorrect. You know what I'm saying? Mm. Like economists, you know, have this, you know, rational idea of humans that they behave rationally. Everyone always makes the choice that's best for them. And it's so clear that that's not true, you know, and you're talking about teenagers, maybe they were evolved to get up to hijinks at night. You know what I'm saying? Like maybe our, they, you know, I, I see in, um, a couple different older movies about, you know, first Na- we call them first nations in Canada, indigenous people. Um, this particular movie was about, um, uh, first nations, uh, the Hurons and their interaction with a Catholic priest, fascinating movie. It's called black robe. Actually, it's an older movie. Um, but anyway, at night, the teenagers were all taking off out of the teepees and running off mm-hmm. and getting up to what teenagers like to get up to. And, you know, right. they didn't want to go to sleep. That, that was actually shown in the show, uh, in the movie. And so, um, yeah, like maybe that's, maybe that these things are just part of what we are, you know? And, and right. You know, yeah. And there's actually some research along that I'd love to share mm-hmm. is that um, there was a research in a small village following the adults sleep for 30 days and this was a village that did not have electricity modern day village that did not have electricity they found that there was only like 17 minutes that all of the adults were asleep at the same time in the whole month because some people get up early some people get up late go to bed late. Some people are awake in the middle of the night. And just think about, you know, human history. It's probably great for a tribe to have a few people up at every hour, right? Who can raise the alarm. And so, Mm -hmm. um, you know, the reason that it is a soapbox for me is because I've just seen so many patients who are being judged by others. And so I like to take the opportunity to um, just, you know, share how, a, it's not something that people are choosing, whatever they are, morning type, late night type, and that it probably has a good purpose for human species to have this variability. Just like you want to have, uh, you know, somebody tall in your household who can get this tall st- tall shelf and somebody short who can get the things that are underneath the bed, right? You know what? It's helpful to have variability in human population. It's so refreshing to, for me, Dr. Darley, to hear, because, you know, I, as I've gotten older and less hair and all this kind of stuff and big family, I've seen lots of different things going on. And one of the things I've noticed is that people tend not to accept people the way they are and where they're at. You know, it, it, you know even, with a, even with a child that's yours, that's maybe 13, 14, you, you, a parent has to look at it and say, how much control do I actually have over this human being? And how, how much, because responsibility is about control. If you can't control something, you have no responsibility for it, right? That's employees. I'm an employer, so I control my, respo- my employees from nine to five. I'm responsible for what they do, right? So I because I have a certain amount of control. After five o'clock, they're on their own. Go on, do your thing right? With your children, when they're very young, you, you have so much control over them. So you have lots of responsibility, but that's got to fade. Like those two things got, they, they slide away. And as people become adults and all this sort of stuff, you can't help them by interfering or judging them or, you know, you got to get up early in the morning. You got to do this. You got to do that. We really have to start letting people be where they are, you know, and, and where they're at. Yes. And, and, and until they can feel like I'm not, I don't have to be ashamed of what, where I am and where I'm at, then maybe I can start living a healthier lifestyle from that point forward. And I think there's a lot of interference and confusion from doctors, from family, from parents, from aunts and uncles that are, you have to be like this, or you have to do that, or you have to be this way or that way. And I think we should probably all back away from one another a little bit and really just encourage and support and give good information if we can. You know what I'm saying? Right. I totally agree. 
Um, I would like to give some good information before yeah, we course. part about yes. what are the light recommendations, because this is something um, that just recently, a year ago, an expert panel gave updated light recommendations for circadian health and sleep. And I'd like to make sure that your listeners have this info. So during the day, you want to be getting 250 lux with blue light in it. And um, many office environments and home environments aren't 250 lux. You really have to be outside in those kinds of environments to get 250 lux. So I did a little test. I've got a computer here, one to the side, some overhead lights and some windows on this other side. And it was 160 lux. And I'm going to tell you right now, those... 250 lux is a lot of electric light. It's nothing for sunlight. Right. It's nothing for sunlight, but it's that's a lot right. of electric light. And most people in an office like that, Dr. Darley would tell you to dim the lights. Yeah. So it was 160 at, yeah. at my um, desk. And then I went and stood outside and it was 16,000 lights. Yes. It's not so even a comparison. Just think, right. It's not even comparison. And so one tool I like people to do is on your smartphone, download a Lux meter app. I'm sure you have opinions on how good they are, but I think that it's useful just to start increasing your awareness of light. And then for three hours before bed, 10 lux or less without blue light. And um, I'm sure you've talked about this, how one lux is the measure of one candle flame from three yep. feet away. So 10 lux for three hours before bed is hard for a lot of people. You're still in your tasks, right? So in that case, I recommend people wear blue blocking glasses. They make everything a beautiful reddish sunset hue. Mm. Um, and then for sleep time, one lux, again, no blue. And if you have to get up and care for a baby or use the washroom, then you want to have at most 10 lux. So rather than people sleeping with a night light or the hall light on, I really strongly recommend that people have a bedside table with a lamp or a flashlight that they can turn on easily to get that 10 lux and be mm. safe if they need to move about, but otherwise no light in the bedroom environment uh, during sleep hours. That's the best recommendation. And um, yeah. What about what a couple think, things, a couple questions sure. on that, right? First is to comment on the light meter on your phone. Listen, it's not a it's not a tool for lighting professionals, but it's something to help you get an idea of what's going on. Right? Great idea. Right. Yeah. You know, I wouldn't use it here to measure the light levels of a stairwell if they met code or not, but definitely in in that arena. And who knows? Some of those apps are actually pretty good. There's probably ones that have been calibrated to IES standards. How do what do shift workers do, Doctor Darley? Shift workers should, in my opinion, should consult with a sleep professional, either a sleep clinician at a sleep lab, or there's another field called behavioral sleep medicine. And they there's a website you can look and find a pr practitioner near you. Because of the altered circadian environment, consistently getting light at night, and the sleep deprivation that goes along with shift work, shift workers have some meaningful increased health risks that in my view mean they need extra monitoring. They're um, more at risk for depression. They're more at risk for heart disease, obesity, um, a few cancers. Divorce. Possibly. Divorce, probably. Everybody knows yeah. it's, a tro it's a trope. I mean, but all police officers are divorced. All paramedics are divorced. All pilots are divorced. <laughs> I mean, I have I, I have know. police officers, paramedics, and pilots in my family, and all of them. It's such so many of them. You go up with my uh, you know, brother who's a pilot, and they there are uh, half of them. Like it's way higher, just anecdotally, that these shift workers uh -huh. end up. Now I don't know if that's because they never see each other, or but but it's probably you know what like most things it's probably a mixture of frailties. They're more likely to be depressed. They're more likely to be agitated. They're more likely to not feel well. You know, and all these sort of things. And we, and we unfortunately take those things out on the ones we love the most, Dr. Darley. So sh shift workers right. need to be really careful.
I think they need to be really Yes, I, and there is a little bit of um, research about what you can do to increase harmony in your household if you're a shift worker. So yes, I agree on that. And um, yeah, I personally wouldn't choose to do shift work. Fortunately, my profession doesn't require it, but I think that, um, you know, I just hope that all of the shift workers are getting, you know, extra physicals and extra blood work and extra screening for these disorders that are increased among people who do shift work. You know, I, I've told my kids, I don't care what you do. Just don't be a shift worker after all these, but that's exactly what I told them. I said, that, you know, you don't want to be a doctor in emergency from one to three, eight a.m. in the morning because you're going to end up in the hospital yourself. Um, you know, and God bless them because all of our brothers and sisters out there, all the first responders and all that that we really need out there. But do we really need twenty four seven WalMarts? I mean, yes, right. I mean, there are definitely um, specialists that w and workers that we do need as a society to work mm. uh, round the clock and. I don't, you know, I like to advocate for police sleep because uh, the individual police officers are really bearing the brunt of uh, a system that could be improved. Mm -hmm. And like I said earlier, you know, I my personal mission is to create environments where people can thrive. And there's so much that could be do, done with uh, police shift scheduling and then i do hope that the individuals who are doing shift work you know get extra monitoring go to see the doctor at you know every six months for screening make sure that you're getting these additional risk factors addressed and if you're in ontario and you work in a, uh, the ontario ministry of health you got to change it for the shift workers this once a year physical thing it doesn't go for everybody man as Dr. Darley's saying, and you know, um, I really think that I, I was reading this study, I can't remember where it was, and what they were doing is with young boys when they hit puberty, they were measuring the lengths of their arms and their muscle mass and all this kind of stuff, and then saying, No, actually, you should throw the discus. Why? Well, because you have this long arm here, and all discus champions, they all seem to have this kind of bone structure at this length, at this height, and they're like, Or, or you should be a javelin thrower. And it, I think it was, um, I think it was one of the Eastern Bloc countries in the Soviet Union that they started because they wanted to win in the Olympics. So they started saying, you know, instead of playing everybody in Canada plays hockey, right? Well, maybe you shouldn't be a hockey player. Maybe maybe you should think about becoming a tennis player because there's no professional hockey players that look like you. But a lot of professional tennis players have your exact same frame and body. Gosh, wouldn't it be great if we could do that with professions? You know, hey, you know what? Your circadian clock seems to skew that you like to stay up late at night. You know, I think you, you really should think about getting into professions that you work at night because it seems like you like to go to sleep at 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning. And instead, it's just, what do you want to dream to be when you grow up, kid? What's your passion? And kids are like, huh, what are you talking about? What's my passion? I like playing video games. Um, kids don't know. And jobs are so practical. At the end of the day, and I, I know maybe um, maybe you're very passionate about what you do, Dr. Darley, but I sell light bulbs. And I get after it every day, and I, I don't love selling light bulbs. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's a job. I do it. and it might, you Right. Know, I yeah, no, I think, yeah, I definitely agree with that, that people sh um, paying attention to their chronotype, whether they're a morning person, night person, neither, it makes total sense. And I've had some patients who are just strongly night owls. And, you know, one fellow comes to mind, he was, I think, around 28 or 30. And he was struggling to get up and be at his job early in the morning. Well, I don't think it was that early even, but it was early for him. And I said, well, is there any way that you could do this job for a different company working later or negotiate your work hours? and or switch you know to use your skill set in a different way and his face kind of lit up and he said i had the best sleep and i was the healthiest ever when i worked at a bar and i just had you know i was at work until two o'clock in the morning and so then we were just you know 
Yeah, I mean, I was, it's not exactly medical care, but it is medical care if a person is in a setting where they're just going to be struggling. And, you know, he was going to, you know, the current job was that environment for him. And so I think it's totally makes sense. And and we do know that people who have more of a night night type do do better with shift work. So people who are morning types, women are more morning types, older people are more morning types. And um, yeah, younger people, men, more, more night types, generally speaking, of course, you have to personalize it. But yeah, are I you kidding me? Makes good I sense. would go to bed as easy early as possible. When I, I, I was so excited when I got to go to bed at eight o'clock with my kids. I have four kids. So my wife, I used to come home. She's like, uh, I'll put the kids to bed. So I go put them all to bed at 7.30 to 8.30, and I'd be there. And I'd be like, okay, now I'm going to bed too. <laughs> and I would get up. I, right. I used to get I get up about 5 in the morning now, but I used to get up at 3 o'clock in the morning kicking cats. I'm telling you, where I'm up, poof, and I'm gone. And I, I used to sit in my room when I was younger going, well, it's so weird to go to work now. Why would you do that? And then I met one of the guys that works here, and he used to come in at five, four or 5 in the morning. And I said, you know what? I'm in, man. So him and I. We've been coming in early. I used to come at 3 o'clock in the morning. But then I'd go home and go to sleep. People are like, how do you do that? How do you do that? I go to bed at 8 o'clock at night, buddy. Now my nice. kids are older. I want to spend a little more time with them, so I stay up a little bit later. But, yeah, I still get up. You know, I get my eight hours sleep, but I want to get up. I like to get up really early in the morning. I love that. I feel so good early in the morning. And if you know, for other people, hey, you don't like that? No problem. That's not your thing. But, I, yeah, definitely, you got to think about your – this is why what we were talking about earlier – got to take people where they're at and just let them be like, let them discover who they are and not all this pressure and guilt trips and all this kind of thing. I, I don't think it helps us, Dr. Darley. Any final no. thoughts? Do you have any final? We've gone 46 minutes. I can't believe it. Any yeah, final thoughts for the so, listeners? Um, I would encourage people to take a 10 day period and just really do the light recommendations and at the same time, get the ideal amount of sleep for you, whether it's seven hours or closer to nine, whatever your sweet spot is, mm. and see what the difference is. I like people to, you know, we all hear podcasts or take classes that are really inspiring. And then a couple of weeks later, we realize we haven't actually done the stuff. Mm. So do the things, you know, download the Lex meter, check out your environments, make sure you're getting that 250 Lex during the day. You're wearing blue blocking glasses the three hours before bed, or at least dimming all the light to 10 Lux, having it be very, very dark during sleep hours and see what's better for you. Because I would anticipate that some area of your life that is not going great now will improve somewhat with getting the right light and dark and adequate sleep. 10 days from the time you listen to this. And not only that, folks, but I'll tell you from personal experience, the most important thing to do when it comes to all this is go to restoringdarkness.com. Click that donate button, okay? <laughs> and no, I'm just joking, of great. course. Um, but if you could help us out, you know, the Letting in Darkness Foundation is doing education. We're doing awareness. We're working on the ground with, with people that are in ordinance battles. Um, we're looking for an executive director. Um, and we're going to, if you're out there and you're in an ordinance battle, contact the Letting in Darkness Foundation. We're going to help you. So go to restoringdarkness.com. And of course, uh, we are very, very honored to have Dr. Catherine Darley on the show. Before I go, I know we said we're going to put some other links. You mentioned a link about the light study and all that. Where can our listeners find the, the, the light levels and all that online? Is it on your website? Uh, I believe it is on uh, skilledsleeper.com. I'm on and that And I right will now. double check. And so she, uh, Dr. Garley is going to double check. And, uh, yeah. and we're going to post it, whether it's on the website there. Something will be, if you're listening to this, it'll be on the restoringdarkness.com website, of course. The most important person out there is you, the listener and the viewer. Thank you for doing that. Bye for now. Look no further for dark sky friendly products than Evluma. Since its first product launch, Evluma has carried one or more International Dark Sky Association certified models. If your customer cares about light pollution, suggest the Omnimax with shielding or the Ariamax with full cutoff to reduce uplight and glare. Evluma. 
illuminating the pursuit of darkness.